How's it going everybody? Sean here from Zoobox. Welcome to another daily movie review. Today we're going to be talking about the cult classic from 1980, Flash Gordon. The film is directed by Mike Hodges, written by R Lorenzo Semple Jr., Michael Allen, and others. Um, it stars Sam J. Jones, Melody Anderson, Max von Sydow, Topol, Ornella, Muti, Timothy Dalton, Brian Blessed, Peter Wingard, and others. The plot synopsis is a football player and his friends travel to the planet of Mongo and find themselves fighting the tyranny of Ming the Merciless to save the Earth. So yeah, this is one of these movies that uh, I never got around to seeing. And when I heard about Arrow, Arrow putting out a 4K version of it, um, I figured, why not? Maybe that would be the time I should watch it, right? It's kind of a unique experience where you have one of these cult movies and you've never seen it, but then I get to kind of go watch it back in pristine the most pristine version possible um, because it is a gorgeous looking movie. Uh, the set design, the aesthetics, the costumes, all that kind of stuff like works like gangbusters. And I had known that, you know, I'd seen stills from the movie before. I've probably seen a clip or two over the years. Um, and it's always was, I was always interested in, it. I was more curious about it than I guess really like dying to see it. Maybe that's why it took so long, kind of like out of sight, out of mind. You just kind of move on with your life. Because um, it did have a small revival back when I was a teenager. And then again after, uh, was it like Ted? Didn't it Was it Ted or Ted 2? And one of the Ted movies featured the actor Sam J. Jones. And uh, their fandom for Flash Gordon was like a big part of the movie. Um, and I don't know. I don't really know what to think about it. I, I just watched it uh, probably like an hour ago. And then I checked out some of the great special features that are on here. Um, I guess right up front, just for the 4K, the 4K is awesome. Uh, it looks gorgeous, uh, really, really highlights those colors. It's got a lot of big, popping, comic book, pulpy visuals. It's kind of like an updated version of the 1960s Batman, which makes sense because one of the people involved in the movie, I think his name is uh, Lorenzo Semple Jr., he was also involved in that show. So it definitely has a similar vibe to that, but just in amazing 4K. You know, I've actually bought the 60s Batman series on Blu-ray not that long ago, and that looks amazing. I can't even imagine how cool that would look in 4K, but this, the image quality is fantastic. And the HDR, just the deep blacks, uh, just really making the reds and the golds pop. Everything feels distinct, you know, a lot of detail there. Um, and that was for the, in that sense, it was incredible. I really enjoyed it. And at 20 bucks, like that's really not bad for kind of one of these revival 4Ks. Um, Arrow's, I think this is their second release. I know they didn't do the actual transfer on this. Studio Canal did, I believe. But uh, they brought it to Region 1. That's why I got this one. And there's tons of cool special features. It's pretty loaded. Um, even this is not like the super special edition. I know there's another one that has, I think it has a documentary about Sam J. Jones on it. And some other stuff. And it comes with a bunch of paraphernalia. But I didn't, I like, like I said, I'd never seen it before, so I wasn't going to spend 50 bucks on that. So, but I was like, oh, the $20 one, why not? Um, I checked out most of the special features except for the commentaries. I haven't got around to the commentaries. I don't think that the commentaries are new, though. I think they're archival from whenever they released the special edition DVD like 15 years ago. But I'll probably, I might get around to it. My feelings about the movie, um, as a person that has zero nostalgia for it, had never seen it. Didn't have much of an awareness of even what it was really about other than just the basic plot. I know who Flash Gordon is. I know all about that. But I didn't know what the movie's representation of Flash Gordon would be and what the story would be like. And I was pretty underwhelmed. Um, <laughs> it's a surprisingly boring movie. I think a lot of that falls on the shoulders of Mike Hodges, the director. He's It was a weird choice. Um, and... He was he's mostly a TV guy and had done like a a few movies. He did uh, Get Carter, the original one with Michael Caine, The Terminal Man. Apparently he came in and did uncredited work on Omen 2, Damien. And then right after that, he does Flash Gordon. So he was not exactly some sort of wonderkin, some sort of visualist. And most of the visuals, like the set design and stuff like that, all that was conceived, I believe, separately from him. So he just comes in kind of as a workman-like director to just execute on a script. And it shows. Uh, there isn't much of a vision here in the direction. Uh, the, the vision is all in the design of the film and the way it looks. Like, there are so many possibilities. It was so 
almost like frustrating to watch it to see how like flat it was and how lethargically paced it was um because the story just isn't that complicated and they were just trying to wring out i guess maybe every ounce of the budget with the set design and whatnot because i mean there are scenes basically what the, what happens is you got like four major giant sets <laughs> four or five of them and then inside those sets they just stay there for like 10 15 minutes at a time it's like really weird it's a really odd movie it's an art it's a weird artifact and i understand why it failed you know um as the legend goes you know george lucas originally wanted to direct a flash gordon movie and he couldn't afford the rights he was kind of a nobody at the time hadn't he you know, done i think thx 1138 maybe american graffiti or maybe he was about to do american graffiti and he just couldn't get the rights to it so he makes star wars and you can say a lot of things about Star Wars, but Star Wars is not like a poorly directed movie. Um, and they get everything out of it. But it's the Star Wars, what makes Star Wars awesome is the performances, the characters. It's like the pacing of the film Pay, plays a big part in why that movie works. And if you, you go look at something like Flash Gordon, which has some similarities, there is some crossover. You can understand how one came from the other. But it's like if you took away all that that like artisanal quality of star Wars, all that authorship and you just sucked it out of the movie and you just get kind of a bland Saturday morning cartoon. That's kind of what it feels like. I uh, maybe I'm, you know, I'm probably speaking heresy for some people. Cause I, I know so many people grew up with this and probably have a lot of nostalgia for it. I even know some big filmmakers like Edgar Wright, for example, cites flash Gordon all the time. He loves flash Gordon. So I feel kind of weird weirdly apathetic about it i just i was kind of like watched it and it just felt like it was going on forever i was and i was i was ready for it too i was in to watch a movie like this i wanted to do that i wanted to embrace flash gordon i was hoping it would be some sort of lost gem something that was just kind of misunderstood and maybe it could be rediscovered like so many people kind of imply that it needs to be rediscovered and what i found was just kind of a boring slog a beautiful slog but boring nonetheless I was having a hard time just keeping my eyes open sometimes and just not just totally just glazing over, <laughs> but there is some good stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I like in a vacuum. Um, I love Max von Sydow in this as, uh, as the emperor Ming. He is fantastic in this movie. Um, even I would say Timothy Dalton's not bad given, you know, based relative to what he's given to work with. Uh, Brian Blessed plays this big Hawkman dude, Prince Volton, I think his name is. Uh, he was really good. They, those people are a lot of fun. They kind of like seem like they understood the material in a ways that not everybody seemed to get, especially the main guy, Sam J. Jones. What a fucking dead fish. What a what a duck. What an albatross hanging around the neck of this movie. Uh, the guy has zero fucking charisma. He is not a leading man. And I, I feel bad saying that. I, I really do, honestly. It kind of hurts my heart a little bit to say that about a person, but he was so... I don't even... One note? I don't even know if it rose to the level of one noteness. And I don't know if that's his fault or the director's fault. You know, because the character Flash Gordon is just this basic dude. He is basic hero man. He's an archetype. And it feel like when they went and they reworked the script, like they just, maybe they were hoping that they were going to get an actor that would be like enigmatic or something to fill in the gaps. Because they give him like nothing interesting to do or work with. In fact, for a lot of the story, and this is another problem I just had with the movie in general, is that the heroes are kind of passengers because they're audience avatars. They're, they're in, they've come to this world, Mongo, and they're discovering everything. So they're being just spoken at a lot, or they witness things a lot, or they have something explained to them a lot, and it doesn't, doesn't do anything to invest you in them or even their arcs. They have kind of no arcs. Uh, they f feel like they're the same people at the end of the story as the beginning of the story. The, there's a romance between uh, Flash and Dane. It was, what's her name? Dale? Dale Arden? And it just goes nowhere. 
Uh, I don't understand at all. And even giving over to the, the fact that it's like a cartoon, it's like a comic book or whatever, even with that in mind, it's still just, I don't understand what the fuck was going on. Is there something on the cutting room floor? Is there some sort of master cut of Flash Gordon that that contains all the hidden scenes that would have made those things play out better and make sense? I don't know, you know? And it's weird because I, like, I, I don't, I have an affinity for movies of this era and even movies that are kind of failures that don't work a ton. I talked about a while ago, another movie that came out within this time period was crawl and crawl is another movie that's like a fantastical world. And it's kind of like a star Wars esque thing. It was definitely put into production because of the success of star Wars, just like flash Gordon. And that just had a little bit more going for it. There was something more charming about, like the actors involved and, uh, and the direction was a little more authored. It felt a little bit more present. This just feels like a really big budget, like TV movie, but it just lacks so much creativity. There's no creativity in the direction. And I'm telling you, that's what fucking sinks the movie. There are so many crazy, cool things going on in flash Corden and it couldn't be more boring. I was like, I'm shocked. I'm sitting there in my living room and I'm staring at the screen and it's all beautiful and I am stunned. I am stunned at how bored I am and how little investment I have on in anything that's going on. It took a lot for me not to like pick up my phone or flip open the laptop because uh, I just could not engage. I just could not get invested. I don't even think this is something that I would grow on me, to be honest with you. I don't know. Like how I will like I yeah, I'll probably watch it again. I might give those give the the uh, the commentary with the director a spin. I love doing that when I watch a movie I don't like and I own it and there's a commentary on it. I dive right in. I want answers, <laughs> you know, and I want it straight from the horse's mouth. Like, why did you make these decisions? What led you down this road? It's even better though sometimes when you watch a bad movie with an audio commentary if the if the if the commentary was recorded before the movie was released so they don't know what like the critical or audience reception is to the movie and they're just completely oblivious and they're talking talking about like they've just made like Citizen Kane like they've just made Stalker <laughs> It's always fun. Uh what's his name? That you know that guy Uwe Boll He's got some great commentaries. I think, you know, he doesn't care if he's critically reviled or not, but they're a lot of fun. He's just, he's like, always, he's always, always about to tell people to go fuck themselves. Oh, you think this is stupid? Go fuck yourself. And, um, so I, I'm curious. I'm curious what Mike Hodges has to say. I doubt he's going to be very real about the movie or the challenges of making the movie, the circumstances, because it has become a cult classic and there's a lot of people. Like I said, that are big in the industry that really like it, you know, I mean, you got to take it for what it is. Like I said, I don't have nostalgia. If I maybe had seen this when I was 10, maybe I would feel differently about it, but I didn't. <laughs> I was watching it with my wife and we were like, it was like, oh man, this would be a great movie to watch when you're like stoned. You know, if you got like an edible and watched Flash Gordon, then maybe it would be an interesting movie. Isn't it's too bad too because there's so many things about it that I did actually appreciate and liked, uh, mostly to do with the visual design. I just wish they did something dynamic with this stuff. I mean, fuck, move a camera, do a dolly shot for Christ's sake, ho- Christ's sakes. I mean, come on, Hodges, move that fucking camera. Everything is locked off. It's just these plain shot, reverse shot scenes. There is not a lot of interesting dynamic movement or anything. And they have all this gorgeous sets to, to use. I don't know if that was a functional thing, like maybe because of special effects, lighting, whatever, maybe it would have been too hard. Maybe they had a tight schedule. I'm not sure. Um, or maybe they were trying to recreate the look of the comic book or something, but Jesus, man, it's not even a Dutch angle. <laughs> if you're trying to do a comic book, but really, really underwhelmed by it. I am, uh, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. I know that there's going to be people that find this maybe this week, a year from now, they're going to be like, go fuck this dude. Fuck this dude. Doesn't like flash Gordon motherfucker talking shit about Mike Hodges. My fucking main man. I think the omen two is great. What the fuck is your problem? 
I'm sorry. I think that guy let this material down. And it's an interesting... Flash Gordon has an interesting uh, production history, actually. Um, one of the people that was going... To, that had worked on a version of this movie... I'm going to look his name up real quick. Well, I know his name is Nicholas Roeg. And he most famously directed uh, The Witches. He directed uh, this movie called Bad Timing, Don't Look Now. Um, the Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie. And they were going to do... He wanted to do kind of a more serious, kind of dark, dystopian version of Flash Gordon. Uh, he wanted to do like a serious sci-fi movie. And let me. When did he direct the Man Who Fell to Earth? That's what we got. That's what we got. The Man Who Fell to Earth came out in 1976. So this would have been his follow-up to Man, the Man Who Fell to Earth. And that movie is a very much a hard sci-fi. It's about an alien who comes to Earth and try, kind of like discovers the nature of humanity. It's, it is what it is. It's a, it's an okay movie. It's not one of my favorites. But he's a much more serious-minded director. But they did like a, I think for a while, maybe a year, year and a half of pre-production stuff and. Um, concept art and scripts and all that kind of stuff while waiting to try to get the movie into pr production. And the producer for the movie is Dino De Laurentiis, who has produced a ton of, oh, a ton of my favorite movies, honestly, um, especially in the eighties and the nineties. I know he did, uh, what does he do? He did total recall. I'm going to blank because now I've, <laughs> now I've, I've invoked his name. Dino De Laurentiis. Let's see. What is film? Like? Yeah. Maximum Overdrive. He just did a lot of genre stuff back in the day. Um, the Dead Zone, Firestarter, Conan the Destroyer, Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, he's got a lot of stuff like that in his uh, Army of Darkness. I mean, come on, baby. Dune. He's got a lot of stuff like that in his in his producing film filmography, but apparently he was like the one of the original like Weinstein's like the, uh, the Weinstein brothers back in the nineties were notorious for just being fuckwits and just having to touch every, having to be involved in everything. And, and often like undermining directors and taking, taking over sets and just being miserable. One of my favorite audio commentaries ever is for, um, Guillermo del Toro's mimic. And while mimic is, I think mimics an okay movie. Uh, the commentary is great because he had a clash with the Weinstein's and he just kind of goes for it. Like he doesn't hold anything back in the commentary. He did the commentary like way after the fact that it was for like an anniversary, maybe like the 15th anniversary of mimic or something like that. And he just, he just lets him have it. And he's like, fuck the Weinstein's. <laughs> but Dino De Laurentiis was like that. And he was constantly interfering and constantly being like, there needs to be more jokes. There needs to be more jokes. He's an Italian guy. That's my great Italian accent. Um, and he was just constantly undermining the kind of vision of the film. And actually one of the better special features on here is kind of a little mini doc. It's like 26 minutes long. Uh, it has the original writer, some of the special effects guys, some of the concept art guys, and they just kind of talk about uh, the movie that didn't get made. New Nicholas Roeg's movie that didn't get made. It's a little bit like uh, if you've ever seen Yodorowsky's Dune. Alejandro Yodorowsky was the director of, what is it, uh, The White Mountain, El Topo, among others, uh, La Sangria, kind of a cult art director. He was going to do a version of Dune, and there's a feature-length movie that goes into what his intentions were for Dune. So it's kind of got a little bit, little bit of that flavor, this kind of lost movie that was never never finished, but there was a huge kind of production Bible about what their intentions were for the movie. Dean De Laurentiis just shut it down and kind of just hired hacks. He wanted it to be broader. He wanted it to be more accessible. He wanted it to be a uh, big over the top star Wars. Um, because the reason why Dino De Laurentiis buys the rights to flash Gordon is because star Wars is successful. <laughs> That's why. And he had the money to do so, so he went and grabbed it. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, it's one of these things you can't say in hindsight, like whether that direction would have been better, but at least I know about Nicholas Roeg is that he does have a point of view. He has a vision for what he wants to put up on screen. Mike Hodges is, is the most, one of the most workmanlike directors and not the good way. You know, oftentimes I'll say, things about workmen like directors and I'll be like, but you know, 
they're good. I like their movies. Uh, John Borman comes to mind. You know, Point Blank, Hell in the Pacific, Excalibur, Zardoz. I've talked about a couple of those movies, but John Borman is like a, an example. Another Englishman, actually, just like Mike Hodges, um, who's a great journeyman director who was just understood the fundamentals of storytelling and filmmaking and can kind of touch on any genre he wanted to because of that. This Mike Hodges guy is a, a little bit of a hack. Hate to say it. And I wish that's that's what that's I was almost frustrated while watching the fucking movie because I was just like, please. Like, click. Do your thing. And it just presents all of this weird, crazy shit. All this this beautiful set design. All this some weird creatures, weird races of aliens. And it just makes it the most boring thing you've ever seen. It's kind of fucking crazy. <laughs> oh, man. I You know, if you've never seen it, I would definitely say give it a shot if you're into just film history or if you just want to see something that's super colorful. If you have access to... Uh, some sort of mind altering substance, maybe give it a go. Cause I think you're, you probably blow your mind a little bit. Um, especially when the Hawk men come, you're flying in the sky, these beautiful <laughs> weird skies, <laughs> multicolored cloud weirdness. It's a lot of fun. That stuff's a lot of fun, but I don't know. I think most people, if you haven't did not see this when you're a kid, you're going to end up feeling a lot like me where you're just like, what? <laughs> Why? So you can understand what it's trying to do, and it just never does it. That's It's just wildly frustrating in that way. Probably one of the more frustrating things I've watched in a while. But I'll say this. This 4K is gorgeous. Like I said up front, it is one of the better looking 4Ks of um, kind of one of these cult films that has come out. And they did a really great job on the transfer. Obviously, a lot of love and attention put into it. And it looks gorgeous. It's Flash Gordon has never looked better, everybody. Um, not that I think it ever really looked terrible, as far as I've ever seen. I mean, I've seen clips of this movie, and it always looked interesting. So, I don't know. I don't know. If you got the, the DVD or whatever, maybe don't upgrade. <laughs> maybe save save the 20 bucks. Be smart. Don't be like me. I'm an awful monster. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to know more about ZooBox, you want to check out everything that goes on with ZooBox and ZooBox Nation, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my personal Twitter. Also, Dan's Twitter is on there now. Also, if you would like to make a recommendation for one of these daily videos or if you just want to tell me off, throw it down in the comments. I'll put it on the list and I'll read your comment. I'll do it. It'll happen. I promise. We're not that big. Goodbye.